Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm thrilled to see so many people and uh, to feel the vibe here. It's great to be back uh, on uh, to have big Scala conferences. Uh, it's been a while that we had the last one. So I'm I'm standing between. Uh, the now and uh, the party afterwards, so I have to uh, uh, keep myself reasonably short. So what I want to say in this talk is some words about uh, where I see the role of Scala in the programming languages ecosystem. In particular, I would want to give you some history. Uh, why was it created? Uh, where do I see its role now? What are the challenges we are facing? Is Scala still relevant? and uh, where I do I see its future. And these are my personal opinions, so I don't speak for anyone here, I don't speak for EPFL, I don't speak for Scala Center or, or any, any of the other things. I, it's my personal opinion that uh, I just wanted to uh, put down in slides and in the talk. So let's start with the beginning. Why was Scala created? Well, when was it created? That's a long time ago, it's in 2004. And the reason why was I, I wanted to demonstrate that combinations of functional and object-oriented programming could be practical. Uh, there was a, a lot uh, around during that time. Object-oriented programming was the industry standard, undisputed. Uh, functional was essentially all academics. Uh, in industry, there was no traction whatsoever. Uh, but uh, there were a lot of people who thought, well, maybe we can take the best of both or combine the two. And I thought I had some idea how to do it and worked more on essentially small languages, calculi, things like that. And uh, until at some point I thought, well, I, I think this could actually work. Now we have to show that it can actually be practical. And initially it was essentially just intended as a demonstrator to show uh, that that you can write useful programs with that. Uh, in the first years, we got one or two users, probably not many more than that. And then suddenly it exploded uh, around 2008 that uh, companies like Twitter picked it up and Foursquare and others. Twitter, you must know at the time, was a company of 25 people, including uh, ops. Uh, so it was a startup, basically. And they were doing Ruby and having too many fail whales, too many crashes. So the investors told them, do something serious, go on the JVM. But they were language enthusiasts and say, well, we want a, essentially a, a language that lets us express ourselves better. And well, there was this, this new kid on the block, which at the time was Scala, uh, uh, and it runs on the JVM. So they picked that and the rest is history. So uh, the early slides, I always had essentially this slide to say Scala really is a unifier in many dimensions. In particular, it's a unifier between object-oriented and functional. As we know, it's not just essentially two languages side by side with one set of constructs geared towards functional and the others towards object-oriented. They're one and the same. So a function is an object and an object is a function. It's really one and the same thing so that you can smoothly uh, use everything from one side on the other side to a degree where you don't notice that there's a difference and one should really invent a new, uh, a new uh, paradigm for that functional object oriented. It's still two words. Uh, we would need something shorter than that. And with that, the other claim was that we get a very scalable language that can go from a, a lightweight syntax for small scripts and notebooks to uh, very, very large systems. And that's all also true. I mean, Scala is a very uh, good language for scripting, for using it in the REPL, for exploring, for teaching, programming, all these things. And at the same time, it is a workhorse for systems of 10 million lines of code and, and more. And the interesting thing is that it achieved all that with one set of constructs. It's objects from the REPL to these large systems, and there's nothing uh, bigger than that for programming in the very large or things like that. The claim at the time was that's possible, and I think we have proven uh, by and large that it is. So then Scala became popular, the, a user community formed, uh, uh, quite enthusiastic. And the, at the time, why did that happen? I, I think it happened because Scala had a fairly privileged spot uh, here. You see on, on the right, uh, let me see whether the laser here works. Uh, not really. Okay, but you see, you see it big enough. Uh, so it's a language that is the, the lower axis here is functional, 
and the upper axis here is strong static typing. It's a language that is, goes quite, quite a long way in both without being maximalist. So it's not 100% functional. It's a language that essentially prefers functional, but uh, uh, doesn't really force you to be 100% pure. And the same holds with type systems. So it's a language that has strong static typing support, but if you want to use it in a looser fashion with uh, it's essentially more patterns coming from dynamically typed languages, that's also possible. So it really sits, sits in, in there. And uh, there were a couple of other languages. Uh, OCaml was there already, F-sharp came later, but it had sort of the field more or less to itself. And that essentially caused a, a lot of people to pick it up and do great stuff with it, uh, from the Twitter stack to Akka to uh, Spark, uh, uh, Flink. Uh, lots of really cool software was written in Scala. And it was written in Scala because essentially people saw that this, here, here was a language that lets us express these things easily and quickly. OK. So that was 2010, a long time ago. What happened since? Well, what happened is that basically all the other languages, they move towards that very direction, right? So they became more strong, stronger typed, more types. Uh, uh, a lot of the dynamically typed languages acquired optional type systems in the meantime, and they became by and large more functional. Uh, so the, uh, the fact here is that, uh, let's just see. Uh, I, I'm, I'm missing a slide here. Okay, and what what happened then in the end is that essentially a lot of languages ended up much much closer to Scala, not just the existing ones which were around in 2010, uh, but also a lot of new languages that came up since then. Uh, whether you talk about Kotlin or Swift or Rust or TypeScript, all of them are very much in that space and have adopted quite a lot of features that Scala has pioneered. Now that you see all these, uh, this language zoo, it's uh, maybe uh, not so apparent of what things actually Scala was, the one that pioneered them. Uh, that means it introduced them, or at least it made them popular. Maybe sometimes they were already introduced before. So I'll just give you a list of some features that uh, were essentially Scala firsts. So first one uh, is x colon t. I say, well, that's a Swiss notation, right? It was already in, in Pascal, and now it's in Scala, and things like that. True, uh, and so it means it's, it's a lot older than Scala was. It probably was introduced by Pascal, or one of the predecessors of Pascal. But in the, the time when Scala was introduced, 2004, that, that notation was essentially non-existent. So all the languages that used it had gone out of existence. There was still ML, but ML was essentially, like I said, an, an academic niche languages. And that was essentially something that was completely different. And when we introduced that, there was a huge resistance. That's why I put it up first. There, for many, many years, people said, tell me, Martin, if you only had written TX, we would take your language seriously. But X colon T, uh, forget about it. It's just, it's just too much of a, of a, of a jump. Uh, it's too much of a, of, a, of a change. And now, of course, well, what happens? All the new languages use X colon T or XT in the case of Go, and almost nobody uses the, the opposite convention anymore. Another thing to stay with syntax, optional semicolons is something that existed in JavaScript before, but it never worked very well. In Scala, we essentially uh, invented the rules to make it work solid, so nobody in Scala land is missing semicolon or is writing them. It's been a long time that I've seen code that used semicolons. Uh, Lightweight lambdas is another thing. Uh, so this x arrow x plus one syntax was, as far as I know, invented by Scala and has been copied by a lot of other languages since. Um, another thing that is uh, very important uh, is expression orientation, that, so that Scala doesn't, split, doesn't distinguish between statements and expressions. And uh, if you, uh, it's for, for us, it's completely natural, of course, everything is an expression. Of course, I can uh, have an if-then-else that can return values. Of course, I can, one of these branches can be a throw that throws an exception. All of that is completely natural, but it isn't, it wasn't before. Uh, there was a world of expressions and a world of statements. And for instance, I had a nice uh, talk by Andre Breslav, the original inventor of uh, Kotlin, or one of the original inventors, who said he talked with Anders Heilsberg, the inventor 
of C Sharp and uh, later on TypeScript, and said, well, it's really cool. This throws in, 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 in Scala can be an expression. Uh, that, that's really nice. It should be an expression. And Anders said, yeah, but uh, what, what should its type be? Uh, uh, it can't be unit if it's a type of an expression. And that was it for Anders then. So it, it turns out that if you take expression orientation seriously, then you have, to, you have to invent the nothing type. You have to invent bottom. And so there's a lot of other things that seem random in Scala, maybe at first, when you get, get around them at first, but which have a reason like that. For instance, nothing for expression uh, orientation. Other things that uh, we are now quite used to and that I believe worked really well are the, the form of type inference, which is sort of not... Uh, global, uh, it's not 100%, uh, but it works actually pretty well in practice, and it reinforces good habits that you should declare your parameters of functions and, and uh, for public functions also the result types. The idea of having traits as mixins is, is another thing that essentially gives you flexible composition of, of, uh, of aspects of components, and I think there also Scala was the first. Uh, Further things are generics with declaration side variants, the kind of pattern matching we do with case classes and these flexible patterns where you don't just have these deconstructors but also case x colon t, these, these things, they were all first in Scala, lazy vals, and the list goes on and on. Okay, so what happened since 2010 was, like I said, there were all these languages moving, and now there comes the other slide. So now they're much closer to Scala and there are all these other languages as well. Okay, well, I could say, well, I'm, I, could, I could retire now uh, and said, uh, purpose achieved. Uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery, right? Uh, but there are, I, I, I do, do care about Scala and uh, there is a challenge that Scala now is, has, no longer has a space for itself. It's no longer alone in the space. I like to believe that it's a cleaner, simpler, more expressive alternative to most of the other languages. But on the other hand, in industry, in, in the actual field out there, to what degree does cleanliness, simplicity, expressiveness really matter? Well, what the, my reaction then was to say, well, we want to really make other languages are, are catching up. Let's make a big jump forward into the abyss. No, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, and that was Scala 3. So Scala 3 was a reinvention of Scala. It says we are willing to break some things because we have the safety net of binary compatibility that makes it work for us. Uh, and we want to put at the same time the focus on simplicity and safety. That means sometimes in previously in Scala, uh, we had very powerful mechanisms that could do lots of different things but then when you read the programs, it wasn't too apparent what, for instance, all your implicit constructions were supposed to achieve. So in Scala 3, we had this motto to say we want to, where it's possible, uh, 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 focus on intent over mechanism. We want to make it clearer what the intent of what you're trying to achieve in your program is over the low level and very general mechanisms that, that, that are there. Uh, we worked hard to re remove as many language wards and foot guns as we could. Uh, in particular, there's now safe metaprogramming that was probably the, the biggest difficulty moving forward, but also one of the biggest achievements that we have metaprogramming that is independent of essentially some intricacies and, and uh, pitfalls of the actual compiler that runs. Uh, metaprogramming now has a spec, it has safe foundations. Uh, the other thing is we have a much safer context abstraction. Uh, and the third one is binary compatibility is achieved with Tasty. So that's also a huge thing that with the, the times of where every so many years we had to sort of switch and go from 2.13 to 2.14, 2.15, and then everybody had to recompile. With Tasty, those times are over. So you don't need to do that anymore. It's backwards compatible forever. Um, then also we concentrated on better ergonomics and with a focus on software engineering concerns because unlike the green language designer that, that I was 20 years ago, uh, we have collectively learned, of course, a lot from the community, how they applied Scala, what were difficulties and things like that. So it's a huge experience that all has flown into uh, Scala 3 and I believe overall it's a huge win in usability and safety. 
I uh, have talked about Scala 3 uh, several times before, so I won't do that here. I assume that we, we, we know all sort of what it is. Uh, but just in the uh, essentially abstract idea space, are there things in Scala 3 or also Scala 2 that are still waiting to be copied by other languages? So what, what would I hope to see that other languages would pick up? And uh, there, there are a number of things, of course, from small to large, but three large ones that I think are really sort of important in Scala are those three. The first is uh, type members, so that means alias types and abstract types as members of classes and traits, uh, which gives us a, essentially the fabric for first-class modules. So it means that's the reason why Scala has a really good module story, a really good story to, to put things together, and other languages haven't uh, copied that much so far. Uh, the other would, was uh, the concept of givens uh, as a unifying feature of type classes, capabilities, and uh, environment passing. That's also something that I believe is a, something that's unique to Scala. Some languages are looking at it. For instance, OCaml is looking at so-called modular implicits, which, which are quite, uh, quite, quite close to what we did there. Uh, but it's still something, and I think Kotlin has context receivers, which is sort of a very, very special case of a very, very particular use case of this. Uh, but to look at it in its generality, it hasn't happened yet, and I think is worth happening because this is really sort of uh, a, an important uh, set of abstractions that one should learn from the from the roots, uh, from the principles, from first principles, and not from some some specific corner cases. And I think the third one would be to say, well, object-oriented languages, of course, have always been based with inheritance, and we knew for a long time that that, that was not an unqualified good, that uh, in many cases we want to uh, prefer composition over inheritance, but that's easier said than done because uh, so far languages have made it very hard to use compositions. You had to write all, all these forwarders, a huge amount of boilerplate to get this composition, and with uh, the both abstractable extension methods and export, Scala has now much better tools to achieve these things. Okay. So that, that was sort of the feature catalogs. But challenges are not just language features. There are other challenges as well, and they have to do essentially with the community, with the people applying the language. And uh, so one challenge uh, would, would already came up in a very prescient blog post that was 2009 when no, nobody would suspect any of these things. There was this very funny uh, uh, story, a brief, brief, incomplete, and mostly wrong history of programming languages by James Irie. And it's hilarious. Uh, you should read it. You should look it up. They're, they're, they're really uh, pearls uh, about, about many other languages. But here's what he has to say about Scala. So he said, a drunken Martin Odesky sees a Reese's peanut butter a cup ad featuring somebody's peanut butter getting on somebody else's chocolate and has an idea. Uh, he creates Scala, a language that unifies constructs from object oriented and functional languages. This pisses off both groups and each promptly declares jihad. Well, that <laughs> I think there was something to it. Uh, even though at the time I said, oh, this is a great joke, but uh, yeah, uh, good. So, uh, jihad is a bit stronger word, uh, but let's say we have, we have our arguments, the Scala community definitely has this argument, where should it go? To how functional should it become? So maybe uh, one idea would be to say, well, if our languages go where Scala is, so Scala should move elsewhere, it should see this current space and put the emphasis on even more functional programming instead go all the way in for pure functional programming. And there have been various names for this, uh, functional Scala, Haskellator, Monadic Scala, uh, se several, several ideas to do that. So what, what this really means, uh, because in the end, like, let's say a Spark query is a functional program, right? It's functional, there's no side effect, there's no wars. Uh, so, but that's not, not what people mean with, when they say functional Scala. What they mean is really staged imperative programming. Your effects won't go away, but you will put them in a monad and you will have a purely functional program that constructs this monad. And then you hand it off to an effect system that runs your effect. So the idea there was to say, well, let's essentially go to the right. Let's move Scala all the way to Haskell, and then that, maybe that way lies salvation. 
Personally, I don't think this is true. I don't think this is the way Scala should go. So uh, uh, just, just to, you probably know that, but just to state it on stage, I don't think it, 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 sh it should do that. So, and personally, I also think that the benefits of functional programming are not, let's say, uh, uh, it, it really depends very much on, on where you stand. So, what promoters claim is the more functional programming content your program has, the better. It goes even up when you go fully pure, 100%. That's, that's, that's like the, the best of all possible worlds. Uh, what I think in, in, instead is that it goes up until you're about 90%. Definitely, you want to be as, as functional as, as possible. And afterwards, the question is, it depends. For some, for some programs, it's worth to go to the 100%. And for other programs, it isn't. Uh, for other programs, actually using or renouncing on using state is counterproductive. You would be better off uh, uh, doing, uh, doing, using a, a modest amount of state. And also, that's why very, very intentional Scala is at the tip of the blue curve and to say that's, that's essentially where we want to be. Uh, and uh, that's where we opt what we optimize the language for. So, yeah, okay, that's, uh, I stated that like this, and I realize it's a contentious question, so I should back this up. So I want to back this up with some examples which come from code that I have either written myself or seen myself, and that's code in the compiler. So these are real use cases, they're not, they're not made up. So one thing, uh, that's code I had written myself. Uh, uh, the, what, what happened is I came across this function in the compiler, and then I realized I wrote that code six months ago. And I said, well, this, this seems to be a bit harder to understand than other code. Uh, so, well, yeah, so there's a big document. So uh, I didn't skimp on the documents, and the document is actually correct. It tells you what it does, but uh, even when you read it, it's a bit hard to essentially do all these unpackings and things like that of this fold left. So, yeah, uh, I, I looked at it, and uh, after about five minutes or 10 minutes, maybe, I said, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, all good. I understood it now. I said, yeah, but maybe one shouldn't have to spend five, even five or 10 minutes to understand code. Code should be obvious, right? So then I said, well, uh, challenge Martin, make this code better. Uh, how, how can you make it better? And uh, I said, well, I used the fold left. Another thing to do these, these sort of things is with, a, with, a, with, a, with a using recursion. And it could be a tail recursive function. Let's try that. So I tried that. That's what I came up with. Well, it got uh, maybe clearer if you read through it. There were no hurdles to sort of understand that. But it also got a bit longer. And so overall, I said, no, that's not so convincing. I said, well, now let's read for the poison cabinet and do some bars. And then uh, suddenly it, it actually did get better. So here, uh, now this code, I can I actually, I'm not, not ashamed to read to you. Uh, so we have two uh, quantities, refined and all captures, a type and a capture set. And what we do is we go through parameter names and argument types, we zip them together. Uh, and that's a getter name and archetype. Then we, from the getter name, we produce a getter. And we say, if this condition is true, then we update both refined and uh, all captures to the next value. So this is all very, very obvious and clear. So I would say, well, in this, in this uh, concept, uh, uh, that, that's actually the clearest solution. You could say, yeah, but Martin, isn't that bad? It, you, you're using virus. I thought you wanted to be functional. So is that code still purely functional? Well, the point is, from the outside, it's absolutely purely functional. It's exactly the same function that I wrote before. I used two local vars internally to make the code clearer. But from the outside, this is still a pure function in the mathematical sense. Another example, and there I, uh, I'm looking first at another language. One curious thing about OCaml was that it has, uh, for a long time, had uh, and still has two competing libraries that implement list, the most basic type, data type of them all, has actually two competing implementations, one by Jane Street and the other by Inria. Uh, one uses natural recursion for map filter, but that blows the stack if the list gets too large. And the other builds lists in reverse and then uses an, a reverse to get two reverses to produce the final lists. So that needs, is slower, it needs two passes, but it is stack safe. So you, you, don't, you don't blow the stack with long lists. So that's an awkward trade-off, right? Are you stack safe or are you fastest and, and, and most natural? 
So what, what does Scala do in that case? It doesn't, it doesn't have that problem at all. What Scala does, it, it uses a list buffer. And the list buffer can be, once it's completed, it's an imperative structure, of course, can be turned into a list in, an, in a single operation. And how does it do that? Well, it's, it, it, the, the internal workings actually, if you look at the code, source code of lists, then you will actually find out that the tail of a list is a var. What? It's a var. I mean, uh, who, who, who could change the tail of a list? Well, it's actually a var only for the Scala library. Uh, it's not available to you. Uh, so it's only when you maintain the Scala library, then it's a var. And then in, and we, need, we need it to be a var in order to be able to implement this very fast single op operation to turn a list buffer in, into a list. You could also say, yeah, but that's dirty, right? Yes, but we have essentially the best of all possible worlds. We have the fastest implementation of lists, and it is stack safe. So it's definitely worth uh, putting a bit of uh, essentially uh, tricks in there. OK, so I've, I've given you two shiny examples where VARs actually really help. But uh, I should admit, it's not always like that. So another thing also from experience is uh, in the early days of writing the Dottie, the Scala 3 compiler, we chased a mystery bug for several months, and it got worse and worse. So our parallel tests would return random errors and crashes in 10 to 15% of the cases uh, when we ran the tests. And the numbers crept up the more tests we added. And nobody could find the reason why. We looked everywhere. For months, we looked everywhere. And we couldn't find why these tests were crashing. So randomly crashing tests means uh, it could be a data race, right? But where? Where was the data race? And we couldn't find it. So in the end, I actually wrote an analyzer that would reject any globally accessible var unless explicitly declared as shareable, shareable. So just to say anywhere in the code base, let's write a tool that could bring up all these possibilities. And that actually found it. So what we found, the, uh, we found a problem in a file with the innocuous name class file constants.scala. So who would suspect anything wrong in that? Uh, and that furthermore came from the Scala code base. That's why we didn't look at it very closely because we thought, well, uh, that's probably okay. It worked for 10 years in Scala too. Um, so, and that contained a function that translated from JVM flags to the internal Scala flags. You see, uh, flag translation, why would that use uh, state, global state? Nobody would have suspected that such a translation function would have global side effects, but it is. It did. And you see that on the right here. So there's actually a class flag translation, and it has two fields, annotation, is annotation and is class, and those are set by the init fields method, and they are, uh, 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 they are queried by the translate flag method, and then um, uh, there's the field flags and method flags method, which is the external API that both do an init fields and then are followed by a translate flags. Okay, you say, good, still no problem, These Side effects, maybe they are, they are stashed away. But the reason is, the, the, the reality was no. There was a global object flag translation that did it all that extended this abstract class. So in the end, you had two global variables, uh, is abstract and, uh, and, um, and, um, and the other one. And uh, the, what happened then is that as we ran more and more tests in parallel, these things would essentially uh, have race conditions that several init flags would happen at the same time before uh, the flags were queried, and so the flags would randomly get across each other. After having seen code like this, I now understand better why one calls for banning all virus. Uh, that definitely costs us a lot of time. So the difference between the first two examples and this one is that in the first two examples, I showed you encapsulated state. So we have state, we use state, but to the outside, it's a purely functional in, uh, interface. There's still purely functional lists. It was still a purely, fun purely functional mo uh, method. But here we had, by accident, probably introduced global state, uh, a state that essentially was visible uh, to the program globally. Uh, so encapsulated state is sort of the, the nice part of state where we have variables on the inside and pure functional, uh, uh, functional behavior that does not depend on change history on the outside. Because they're the... Okay. So one problem, 
going back to language design now, is to say, well, if we want to say we want to have a mostly functional language like Scala is, where we say we, we have state, use it responsibly, uh, then uh, the question is, well, how do we make sure that th these wires are used responsibly? Obviously, sometimes they are. So we would like to make, uh, use them to make code cleaner and more performant, but yeah, what, how, do we, how do we make sure that everybody plays by the rules? Code reviews, definitely, but sometimes they, they slip through. Here it was because it came from a different code base where we didn't suspect it. Uh, tests, yes, also, but uh, in, a, in a case like this, uh, that essentially only was, uh, the problem only was visible at scale. So when you, when you had lots and lots of parallel tests running together. So it's very hard to write a unit test, for, for instance. So that means Scala has a, an uneasy choice uh, that uh, we can be simple and performant, but in the end unsafe. We have to accept a certain uh, degree of unsafety, or we can be safe, but we have to accept certain trade-offs that we become more complex in places and maybe slower in places as well. And yeah, let's face it, Scala programmers do like their guardrails. Uh, so, uh, and the fact that essentially we have these unprotected wires, uh, it makes some people uneasy. So languages, of course, should encourage uh, good code. So ideally, my ideal would be that a program that looks simple on the surface is also safe and predictable. So essentially, the, 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 the notation should guide you towards the, the right decisions when you write your programs. That would be the, the ideal. But we've seen that with effects, that's actually not always the case. Using effects can certainly make your program shorter, but sometimes, if you use them wrongly, also harder to reason about. Now, if we would all reason about our code from day one, that wouldn't be a problem because we would say, well, this is too hard to reason about, we don't. But let's face it, we don't do that. We just write our code and then things uh, slip, slip through and uh, then the next people who maintain our code, maybe they have to, have to bear the, the consequences. So one answer to that would be to say, well, we use a staged architecture for effects. That's the answer of effect systems. We have in the first stage a purely functional program, no effects allowed, that describes a usually monadic computation. And in the second stage, we execute the effect in the chosen monad or monads. So what that means is a system architecture like this one here. So where we have a uh, purely functional program, that's a big lambda that you see here, and it's in a very rigid box uh, which says, well, that's essentially all you can do in your program, but what you can do is you can produce a value, a data structure or something like a data, yeah. in, in the end, a data structure that can express an effectful computation, and through that data structure, you reach out to whatever, what, all the things that computers can do. So in the inner box is what programs can do, purely functional. The outer box is what computers can do, all these things from uh, handling errors, network, uh, uh, state transactions, uh, file system, other resources, and so on. Okay, so this looks like, a, oh, has, has been a standard architecture for quite a few years, and it looked, looks uh, quite reasonable, but there are also problems. The problem with this approach is first, it leads to a fairly high notational overhead, usually. And the second problem is that, unfortunately, monads don't compose. So one has to essentially, instead of putting monads together, one has to put something else together, like monad transformers, or one uses finally tagless, freer monads. Over the years, there has been a cottage industry of approaches to essentially solve this problem, but I think it's also fair to say that none of these approaches ultimately has won everything over. Or uh, the alternative is put everything into a single super monad, but that can lead to over-provisioning. Do I really need three type parameters for everything I do? Well, there are some situations where I need them, but uh, by going with a super monad like Sio, I, I say, well, that's essentially now what all my programs will look like. So I would say the industry experience with this has been mixed, positive in some places, quite challenging in other places. Uh, yeah. So there has been uh, recently a, an alternative, uh, a, a pioneered in academics by algebraic effects and in practice by languages like Rust and, and others, where um, the idea is that instead of pushing effects and resources in frameworks, we want to 
upgrade our type system so that we can track them directly in the program. So here I have so, sort of this thing, uh, two axes. Of, the vertical axis is abstraction from the gnarly low-level world of computers to the lofty high world of lambda calculus. And the right uh, uh, axis is compile time tracking. To what degree does my language uh, and, and type checker allow to track what kind of effects uh, I use and what kind of resources I use? And if you look at languages here, then, uh, well, there are obviously languages at different abstraction levels. C, C++ is very imperative. Scala and Haskell are very functional. They're high up there. In compile time tracking, almost all languages so far are pretty much to the left side of this uh, quadrant, except for Rust, which is a uh, relatively low-level language. That means it's quite imperative, everything you, you express, but it, does, it has a very precise uh, tracking of uh, effects at compile time with the borrow checker. And what's interesting is that quite a few people uh, are migrating for pure functional programming to imperative uh, plus effect typing, and they don't find it so terrible. Uh, what the, the, the feeling you get is, well, as long as the compiler has my back, maybe effects are, are, aren't so bad. Uh, so, uh, but what I think is, it's kind of a pity that in doing that, you have to lower the level of abstraction. You have to become more inflexible. You have to worry about resources all the time. Everything has to, has, has to have limited lifetimes and so on. So I, I wonder why can't we do the same thing but stay on the nice and functional level of abstraction here on the upper right angle. And that's what we are trying to achieve with the new project that, that we have started this year called Caprese. So Caprese is a acronym for Capabilities for Resources and Effects. So the idea of Caprese is that we want to express capabilities that provide safe typing for both resources and effects. The idea is to have an effect, you need a capability to have the effect, and we track that. What is a capability? Well, a capability is simply a value that I give you, that I pass off, an unforgeable value. And because of ergonomics, I want to pa make this passing of capabilities implicit. That is, if I say, if the caller has a capability and the callee needs it, well, then I don't need to go through procedure and ceremony to pass the capability to, to, the, to the caller. It simply gets passed as an implicit parameter. So Scala's implicit parameters really fit that like, uh, like a glove to a hand. They're, they're a very nice concept for that. But there's one thing that we also have to do is we need to track keep track which capabilities are retained in closures and objects. If I have an object, I need to know what effects can it do, what capabilities does it have inherently without getting something else from the outside in a parameter. And that has been missing so far, and uh, essentially with Caprese we have developed the type systematic foundations for that, and we have developed the first implementation for that, and now we have to push it further. So what that can lead to is a new kind of architecture, uh, which is uh, known as capability staged uh, based architecture, uh, which is not uh, uh, staged uh, as the previous effect systems. It's one stage only. Your program can do, uh, has access to everything the computer can do, but they are all, uh, all require a key. So the key is essentially the capability. If you don't have the capability to essentially access the network, you can't access the network. Of course, that's a very old idea in security and, and operating systems and so on. The novelty here is we have, now it, we have that now in a programming language and a type system. It's supported by the types. It wasn't supported by the types before. So it means that if you have no capability whatsoever, then you're still here, you're in the functional world. Functional world means I, I have no access to resources and effects, but I can sort of uh, uh, bit by bit, uh, organically mix and match, uh, go out there and essentially pick some of these things as, as I need them. So the claim is that these capabilities are the key to simple and flexible effect typing instead of tracking effects, as we do in an effect system, we track the capabilities to perform effects. So an effect is essentially a part of your result, and a capability to perform an effect is a parameter that you take. We push it from one side of a function to the other. And it turns out, I, I don't have the time to go into this, I did that in other talks, uh, it, this solves some really hard and long-standing problems related to 
effect polymorphisms and colored functions. So, so it's actually really good for that bit, uh, because uh, it, 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 it solves some of these problems that uh, nobody knew how to, how to attack before. On the other hand, one can m ask whether effect typing is actually worth it. Uh, but do we really have to push the type system as far as it will go? And in tr it's true. Um, in particular, if effects are local, do you really need the assurance that your var uh, is, is local in a function? It, it, with simple code ex inspection, inspection would actually give you that, right? But on the other hand, we've seen sometimes effect typing is essential. So effects that we want that definitely want to uh, type is effects uh, that prevent uh, data races. So by, by tracking them, we can avoid data races. Fearless concurrency, how Rust says. So that's definitely something that would be a quantum leap if we could, could, uh, could track that. Uh, other serious errors that could maybe arise only in certain situations are uh, use after free or close, unhandled exceptions, things like that. And what's more, I think it's a philosophical question. So we want types to reflect and constrain the possible behaviors of programs, and we don't want large classes of problematic behavior to fly under the radar. So ideally, my ideal for a language would be a language that uh, makes encapsulated effects, the good kind of effects, very easy to declare, no notational overhead for those, and makes global effects of the, like the, the, the really bad kind we have seen in the flag translation very, very hard. So it means that if something like that, if you need a global variable like that, you could say, well, you can have it, but you sort of have to add this capability everywhere to all your code that you are going to access this global variable. And before you're finished, you probably will have changed your architecture and said, no, nah, it's not worth it. Let's keep things simple. The, the problem right now is that uh, to, to, it's, it's too simple to have a global variable. There's no effect whatsoever. You don't see it, see the pain when you write the program. It doesn't, it doesn't get reflected in the types. So that um, means that capabilities should enforce that locally used capability is free and a global resource has to thread it through, be, be threaded through everywhere in the types. So I believe we'll, we're close to getting to a state where shorter and clearer, clearer programs also tend to be safe, and we trust the type checker to guide us to produce good code. The thing I haven't talked about, maybe the next talk, is uh, control effects, because it turns out that all this thing with capability is not only very good at preventing errors, it's also really good at getting new control abstractions in your program. Control abstractions like result with question mark for errors, like what you find in Rust to Swift, generators for iteration, like Python generators that you find there, futures where you can actually wait for a future and you don't have to cobble them all together in four expressions, and so on. So I believe all together it gives a really intriguing, exciting new take on reactive systems. And what makes it possible underneath is that we are now at a state where essentially something like coroutines in looms or continuations or on which we work in the Scala native context are becoming reality and we can essentially base these systems on, on, on these foundations. So what I believe what Scala should be or where we should go is, instead of going right, we go up, we go uh, to essentially more typing, and by which I, I don't mean more intricate type level programming, not at all. So what I want as a goal is to increase the coverage of what types can express without increasing the complexity. That's, that's essentially the goal where we want to go. So, a call to action. So I think we are on a track to make programming simpler, safer, and more expressive with Scala 3 and Caprice. But a language design, even if it's implemented, is just an intellectual exercise without a community of developers that applies it. And that brings me to you. To make the next steps of Scala 3 a reality, we need your help as users, as contributors, and as supporters. And that brings me to uh, Scala Center, one of the main uh, uh, organizers of this event. So the Scala Center has had uh, very fruitful industry partnerships with Lightband, Virtus Lab, 47 Degrees, Scala Center, uh, and many others. But if you look at the total input into, let's say, Scala 3, then uh, it's still largely carried by EPFL, the university, and research contracts. 
And if you want to make Scala 3 a reality in the industrial sense, to really reap the fruits of that, I think we, uh, we, we, we need to sort of make, make a more even balance of the inputs uh, of what, what we can get here. So, uh, Scala Center has a booth. If you can help by whatever means, uh, please talk to us at the Scala Center's booth, which is in the exhibition area. Okay, so I've given you my vision, my spiel. Now it's up to you. Uh, I would like to know from you what you think of Scala state and future. Also, quite basic thing, where do you use it currently? Where do you think uh, you might use it in the future? What are your pain points? What are your suggestions for improvements? Please give your feedback by either talking in Scala Center's booth or Virtus Lab, and uh, is, is also here, or uh, filling out this survey. So I put, your, uh, put, put the barcode here. Thank you.